NZR Aero Sports, Icarus Canopies, now Gyro. That's right, we've rebranded, and Gyro is our next generation. It honours our founder, as that's the name we knew him by, but Gyro also marks the start of a new chapter. And not to be biased, but it's going to be fucking epic. Long story short, we're more us than ever. So if you're new to the sport, or even a Sky God Ninja Turtle, welcome. I think our valiant leader Lucy, Gyro's daughter, Says it best. And we still got that fuck your attitude. <laughs> Rebrand! Woo! Rebrand woo indeed, Lucy. Anyway, head over to gyro.com for more info and get amongst your legends. I was 19, broke, unemployed, and sold my girlfriend's canopy for drug money. So, I thought I'd better sew her a new one. What a sentence, and what a story. This describes the humble yet outrageous beginnings of NZ Aerosports, the home of Icarus Canopies, in the words of our founder himself. From getting a paratrooper toy from his mom, watching parachutes at the DZ as a six-year-old, jumping off the wharf with a parachute made from bedsheets, doing his first jump at 16, sewing his first canopy on a borrowed machine at 19, and starting to sell parachutes out of a garage in 1986, Paul Gyro Martin had an undying love for the sky. Our company started with one man with the wildest of spirits in a true blue sky dream, a renegade. In the time that Gyro created and ran the Icarus Canopies brand until he passed away in 2017, he pushed everything he had to its limits. We miss him and we always will. Gyro is the next generation of NZ Aerosports. It honors our founder, of course, because it was the name we all knew him by, but Gyro the rebrand also marks the start of a new chapter, our next jump. Gyro is the space between sound and silence, art and science, chaos and calm. Gyro is a state of epic tranquility that transcends understanding. That moment, in the door, in free fall, mid-swoop, where nothing but the present exists. A perfect balance of euphoria and thrill. Gyro captures our passion for flying and our commitment to designing break-the-fucking-rules canopies that deliver pilots pure, wild flight. Hey gang, so... I got a new book out. It's called The Upside of Fear, and it's exactly what you think it's about. It's about the good side of, well, getting scared. In it, we talk not only about the science and biology behind fear, but the psychology as well. And it's not just coming from me. It's coming from some of the best in the sport. Omar Alhijalan, Jeff Provenzano, Maxine Tate, and so many more have contributed their sometimes terrifying stories to the book to help you overcome your fear. So head to the lunaticfringepodcast.com. You're going to find the link to the book there as well as the other books. It's available in ebook, paperback, hardback, and audiobook right now. Coming straight from the cockpit, it's another episode of Lunatic Fringe with the fucking pilot. Ready, set, go! Back in the can for another edition of the Lunatic Fringe Podcast and another smiling face on the other end. Straight into it. Here we go. Who the fuck are you and what do you do? I'm uh, Evan Rockner. <clears throat> I am a um, skydiver from Norway. I've been jumping since 88. Um, uh, I have 9,990 jumps. I was no. going to do my 10,000 on the Friday 13th. I tried to challenge Destiny, but uh, Destiny <laughs> failed. <laughs> Mother Nature wasn't cooperating? No, nope. the weather became bad and I didn't get my last 10 jumps in. Oh, fair enough. Well, you're you're in Norway <laughs> right now, right? So the weather's uh, it's on the chilly, snowy side, right? Yeah, beautiful blue sky, uh, light uh, snowfall. And all the ski slopes have opened, so everything is good. Nice, nice. Yeah, the, uh, the same here in Helsinki. It's nice and white outside and, and uh, cold, just how I like it after too many years in the desert. <laughs> yeah. Except Norway, we have also the speed flying 
in addition to the thing what you can do in uh, Finland. So, oh uh, yeah, well, you guys yes. have got a, a little bit more terrain than we have here. It's a bit on the flat side here in Helsinki. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's talk about how you got started. Not necessarily just in skydiving, but in anything extreme. I mean, did you start out skiing and all that stuff as a kid? I was active. Uh, I would say in particularly uh, running and skiing when I was growing up. <clears throat> then I had a year in um, as exchange student in America, and I was the one in the family to take over like a 150-year-old uh, hardware store. So that was kind of what my life was destined to be. Oh, wow. <clears throat> then uh, while waiting to go in the army, I, I was then working in the hardware store for some months, and I was just like, what the fuck? You can't, <laughs> you can't live like this. <laughs> It was really strange because it was like some kind of a distress or in calmness or something in the bottom of myself somewhere. Sure. And something like the, you know, every day become repetitive. And even though a hardware store, if you go in any kind of store, is maybe one of the most fun stores to be in because you always help people having a problem and so on. And no day is similar to the last day. Sure. But still, it became very... Yeah, set. So when me and my friend just passed by a information um, poster about the skydiving course, we snuck into it and we didn't dare to tell our parents until after we paid the money. And, and then we said, tomorrow we will jump. Oh, oh, that's a good way to that's do it. Of, I was started. <laughs> well, now, so the, you're, you're being handed the keys to a hardware store at what age? No, I, I took over only when I was adult, after my education, and I came back to, to our village. But still pretty young. I mean, what, in your in your early 20s? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's awfully early to have your whole map lifed out, uh, or life mapped out for you inside the, the walls of a hardware store. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> but, but in the meantime, I was also working in the army, so I had like 10 years there. Now, what'd you uh, do in the army? I was a captain. Um, I was working with uh, especially military leadership. And I would say the inter interpersonal relationships going on in group, um, say how, how a group develops, how, nice. how the interpersonal connections. Boy, I bet, that, I bet that uh, came into play later in life as a skydiver, huh? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So you you go out and you book this uh, this first jump course with a friend of yours, and you wait to tell your folks until after it's all gone. But how did that first jump go? I was scared shitless. I couldn't. <laughs> I still can't remember the exit, but I do remember. You know, you get the clear and go, and then my brain blocks out, and then I come to myself again after the canopy opens. Hypostatic line, of course. Yeah. And um, and this was in Norway. Yes. At the same time, I remember how confident I felt, let's say, regarding the emergency procedure. I still remember that. <laughs> <laughs> but even though I was blocked out, I was amazed on how uh, the body was tuned in to handle this situation, which I was confident I would if I needed to. Sure. And it didn't take so many jumps before I did need to. <laughs> really? I have uh, 29 uh, reserve rides. But that's a few. Yeah. In less than 10,000 jumps, 29 reserve rides. Wow. I mean. <laughs> but remember the development going on in the canopies in, the, I would say, the mid-90s. Sure. Then I had like 10 reserve rides in two years or something. Yeah, fair enough. And I was a pretty light person. Uh, I was on the national team. So I was very active. So I was very early on on small new canopies, but they sure. were still not fully developed. So sure. all of these were just spin and twin. Sure. Now, what was that very first one? The first one was an old uh, Pegasus that just didn't open. You, were, you know, in the old days, you were used to these long streamers. Yep. <laughs> Three, four, five seconds or whatever. And, and this one just superseded that so i think we came to maybe eight ten seconds and then didn't work in it oh yeah fair well and especially if you're a lighter guy you'd be used to riding out those openings that would be a little bit longer so yeah i can imagine uh at 10 seconds though you're starting to look up going all right come on <laughs> so did you know when you landed because that ver very first jump you say you kind of just blocked everything out until you were under canopy but when you were back on the ground did you know that skydiving was for you or was it a i'm not sure what happened let's try it again and see 
I, I really can't remember quite that. If I, I, I think as everyone, you, you know, you're just super stoked when you land. Sure. And I suppose that's also my thing. But what I do remember is my instructor on that information course before we started. He said something about, uh, you know, how your your mind plays games with you, <clears throat> and also how most people quit before they really get to be a skydiver. Sure. So at that point, I remember I, I just was determined that no matter what, I'm at least going to get my B license before I quit. Nice. And then we only got, I started in August. We only had a few jumps that uh, uh, autumn. And then next year, I remember coming back for a uh, spring boogie, starting up in spring. We were the smallest club in Norway in Voss at that time. Mm. Uh, and then I remember we there was uh, Easter Day and it was totally blue sky. And then far over there, you could see like a tiny little cloud <clears throat> over the horizon. And then I remember just feeling, oh, it's a bit cloudy today. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be any jumping. And then I just at that moment recognized that thing my instructor was talking about the year before. And that helped me then to motivate myself to, to get to the drop zone. And, and then I did a jump. And I think that was when I got really hooked. That's fun that you, the funny that you registered it that way. Cause I mean, I think I've done something similar and I know other people have as well, but that you recognized that an almost perfect day in one cloud, you were looking for an excuse not to go. That's, that's yeah. uh, pretty intuitive, really. I mean, that interpersonal stuff was playing out already. Yes. I mean, that's very intuitive of someone. Yeah, very. And uh, and then I remember I had my jump number 100 and we had um, a big party <clears throat> at uh, at my house. My parents were, were gone. And I remember I was so stoked. I did my jump number 100 and my father comes, okay, isn't it now time? Or now you've done it. Isn't it time to quit now? <laughs> and I'm just like, what? Because now I was really big. Now I was, yeah. whoa. This was really the thing. And then one, two years later, we had this professor. Um, he was the headmaster of the, uh, the uh, Olympic Academy. So he is the one in charge of producing all our Olympic winter athletes mm. for, for many years. And he also turned out to be the first, among the first four river kayakers ever in Norway. Oh, wow. And he did his uh, research and professor degree on... Um, research on high sensation seekers which of course all the skydivers fall into that category sure um and at that time i was at the national drop zone i was just reading a, a newspaper article with his findings <clears throat> and it was like a, a list of nine different things like you drive fast uh, drive fast in cars you're active in multiple sports you um, oppose authorities you experiment with drugs you uh, party hard you um of course, push boundaries and limits. Um, you have a lot of spice on your food. You uh, listen to music while you read. Uh, and yeah, one more. <clears throat> but I remember reading that list and suddenly I see, oh, fuck, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. And accidentally, the same year, this professor was um, was hired to have a seminar in America when the uh, ESO, uh, the big ESO um, chain mm. at a big conference in, in the United States. And we, we were also running a, a ESO gas station. And then my father was there and he was listening to this professor and he comes home and I said, now I see you. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, funny. That was really a, a turning point. And that it's... was where the InHop project started, really. <laughs> You know, it's it's funny, too, because uh, um, I've gone through a couple of times in my career, you look back and you try and gauge where you fall and, you know, the normal skydiver attributes and stuff. And it's pretty much the same thing. You, I hate to be put in a box, but we kind of all fit in this box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We we really kind of do, you know. I mean, I've gone down that same list before, and you're like, "Shit, I guess that, yeah, that's me." Yeah. Oh well. <laughs> so did your and dad? Interesting, interesting enough, um, because this, I, I, from then on, I, I kind of started to incorporate it in different stuff I was doing, business wise and also uh, skydiving wise, mm. and I saw it was very, very true. 
<clears throat> but usually people don't fulfill all the nine. They don't check all the nine boxes. Usually sure. people, seven, six or seven of them. Uh, and then you have a few people that, that do tick off all the boxes. And for sure, um, uh, you find a lot of them in base jumpers, for instance. Yes, yeah. without a doubt. There's uh, uh, one or two of those out your way. <laughs> yeah. So when your your father kind of recognized all these traits in you and that they matched up with skydiving, did that change his opinion of your being a jumper, like actively pursuing it? Yeah, I think uh, I think at that point he he accepted it in a <laughs> in a different way than before. <clears throat> That's kind of the best way to put it, right? That people just accept that this is what we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, oh, well, shit, I guess this person's a skydiver. So how did you start to transition into going from somebody that just was jumping into not just being a skydiver, but being as in the industry as you are? All of this, I think, have to do with uh, with uh, humans and personalities. <clears throat> and really, it started back there first with my interest of these things in the army, with the interpersonal stuff. Then I get this uh, finding from the professor and then i remember very well because uh Vos, did you ever go to skydive Vos? i haven't been yet but now that i'm uh, in this neighborhood i absolutely will be yeah it's really a beautiful drop zone but it also has challenges because we are a small village <clears throat> between mountains meaning that for instance the, the noise of the airplane will be bothering a lot of people sure and because we we're in a village with about 14,000 people. That's big enough that everybody kind of know everybody and small enough that you have some kind of, an, or an, um, you, you can be yourself. Sure, sure. Uh, but because of my upbringing, I was very respectful to my, let's call it local community. So that's, that became, I became the leader of the club two years after I started when I really got hooked. And one of my missions was to, to get accepted by the locals. Mm. For the for the noise we we um, bother them with. Sure. And one of the things I started to notice, even in our very very small little club, at that point we were maybe twenty people or something like that. But when I looked at these twenty people, they were all like, "Wow!" There was a doctor, there was a dentist, there was a lawyer, there was a like highly educated people, but sure. then also um, road workers and um, I would say people without education. Hmm. Um, and that was the first time I noticed this thing very, very true in skydiving. It doesn't really matter who you are; it matters how dedicated you are to the sport. Sure. How many jumps do you have? And then, in the background of those number of jumps, then you find all the personalities. And after I started to go into this deeper, I found that every single one, one hundred percent of the skydivers. I'm sure you too. When I, if I got to know you. You will have well already you told me but everyone has a pretty amazing story some choice some talents some merits something very particular yes <clears throat> and it's I, I have found it to be absolutely true for every single one everyone i've tested out and sit and talk deeper into i will i will find this sure and that's very strange it's one of my favorite things about the sport. I mean, especially since I started doing the podcast, I've had on people that I've known, I thought relatively well for some time, but I knew them, of course, as skydivers. And then I'd get to talking to them on the podcast and ask about their wider life outside of and in skydiving. And I've I've literally picked myself up off the floor a dozen times finding out that the goofy person that was, you know, just literally going ape shit over every jump is a PhD doing wow. these amazing things or that this really soft spoken, mild mannered guy is actually a hardcore police officer. And you're like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it really yeah, is so amazing uh, because uh, uh, we kind of check all that at the door when we show up on the drop zone. Yeah. Yeah. Which is nice. <laughs> well especially in a community as small as you were in you must have loved watching it grow as it has because i mean you're saying voss used to be just a, a very small little club and now voss ho hosts extreme week yeah yes 
<clears throat> I mean, that's a big deal. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, in the 90s. It was really incredible um, because <clears throat> when I attended the course, they also decided this was the last course. Now they want to shut down. Then me and my, my friend started and we got so bitten. So we then were able to, to take over already the next year. And then um, after getting bitten, you know, going to uh, the land for the first uh, boogies abroad um, mm. and going to the national drop zone at Östra Ära in Norway, you know, suddenly my horizon expands within the skydiving. And, and we had some, I think the very first, I, like a bad spot, outlanding. <laughs> sure. That happened sometime in the, I don't know, beginning of the 90s. And I just realized how fun that was, that <laughs> challenge. And I didn't really think about it anymore then. <clears throat> that was just many years later, this came back. But uh, uh, we slowly started to do jumps outside the drop zone, like down at the lake in Voss. And uh, we had a beach boogie, I think that was in 91. And we had this tradition in, in Voss, eating sheep heads. <laughs> And that's uh, something that they start on the first week of September, which is also the season ending of the Norwegian skydiving at that point. Sure. So that was always like a boogie that ended the skydiving season in Norway. And people came with suits and dresses and no rig. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's kind of also where, where the club slowly started to, to grow. Um, then I came into the national team in 94. To 96 and in 96 i was also in charge of running the activities on the on the national drop zone that was the first time we, we any drop zone in in norway um, did more than 10,000 jumps in a season wow i mean you I you you jumped in head first i mean you went from zero to 100 like right off the bat yeah <laughs> <laughs> so the hardware store was a, a a faint memory very quickly. Yeah, that year, uh, Philippe Valor, you maybe know. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So we had him and Mad Dog over as organizers at Östra Ära, and I was jumping out with this sign saying 10,000. And he believed that was my 10,000 jumps, while it was the first time we did 10,000 jumps. In. But he was so impressed because I was so young. Sure. <laughs> and then his English wasn't that good, so we we, we didn't clear that mistake until like a long time after. <laughs> so he thought you were a rock star for the longest time. Something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what was it like, especially starting in a, a small place like Voss, the first time you went to a drop zone like Deland, it must've been a bit of a shock. It was, it was really um, to see that the community was as big as it was and diversified. And especially to to um, experience the U.S. thing, sure. where suddenly the the skydiving was a huge thing, big business, lot of people, lot of activities, big planes. And then again, yeah, and I didn't think about it then, but I, I later thought about it. That same thing about all these individuals doing this sport, amazing people. Mm. On every every single skydiving trip we ever went to, we always met some incredible people sure they well that's that's one of the coolest things about it right is uh, um it's a it's a community that builds itself because you've got people that come from so many different backgrounds with such incredible skills and they all fall in love with skydiving so when something goes wrong there's somebody there that can fix everything there's somebody there yes. that can organize everything you know there's a there's a phd or a carpenter or a plumber somewhere on the drop zone always yes which is fantastic yeah and that's kind of also where the 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 big thing when when skydivos then started to develop and i would say the main thing happened in so after that year on Östra Ära, so in 1997, we organized our club. At that point, we were up to 35 members. Mm. And then we did the 31. We, we had seven four-way teams on the nationals. We had three eight-way teams. We had 15 or 20 people participating in the accuracy competition. And then we set the Norwegian club record of 31 people. 
<laughs> and that stood for, I think it was 14 years before an, another club took it. That's amazing. <clears throat> and that's also when, when we start to get a bit noticed and people start to get noticed about Voss. And um, in Voss, we, until that point, we only had a small little barrack, like one, one little barrack. Mm. And then in, I think it was in 97, um, 98, then we, uh, there's someone called Egilby who was working very hard and he got uh, to buy the whole uh, series of barracks from a waterfall company. Mm. Very cheap. I think maybe we even got them. Wow. Then I went and took a personal mortgage in the bank, uh, which we couldn't do because this was partly uh, financed by the state to build this uh, because it's an athletic sport. Sure. Uh, but then we managed to get the bank to join in that we, we had 30, um, what's, it, what's it called, bailers. Like if, sure. if you don't, yeah, somebody that bailed you out. Sure. So we, we made this uh, thing with the clubs. We had 30 equal um, responsibilities in a way, and the bank joined in for that. And that was then the, the start of the, um, let's say, when, when the extreme week started. Well, and that too would have been about the same time that it was videos of skydiving and the granted it's all pre-social media but that's when P, the vhs tapes were going around and you were seeing these amazing places so yeah. guys like me you know that are sitting in paris valley california are all of a sudden watching you guys in free fall over these stunning mountains with these incredible views going yeah. where in the fucking hell is that and why am i not jumping there yeah <clears throat> yeah you must have seen a huge influx of people coming from all around the world as soon as it started to get known how beautiful that place is. Yeah, and for sure, that, that was really the... I, I was very surprised myself because <clears throat> Voss um, is close to Bergen, so we're best in Norway, and it rained, like Bergen has 300 days of rain a oh, year. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. So Voss is only 100 kilometers east of Bergen, so we should also expect that we have almost equal amount of rain. And then when I was running the national drop zone, I was just kind of registering uh, weather. So I categorized it into good weather day, medium weather day, or bad weather day. And a good weather day, you would be able to jump all day. Mm. A medium, you would be able to jump half day, and bad weather day, maybe one test jump or something. And then to my surprise, <clears throat> like counting 60 days during summer, Voss had like way more <laughs> good weather days and way less bad weather days than Östra which is situated in the east of Norway. Hmm. And how could that be? And sometimes when we took the plane up, it could be cloud covering all over the west of Norway. And then you have one hole and that was over Voss. <laughs> <clears throat> but that's when I noticed that, okay, the, the, the location of Voss is actually pretty amazing. And it is because of the, the mountains. So weather stops on the mountains sure. coming from west. Were coming from east and usually then was is just at that uh, line and Which also is... because of the mountains we are surrounded with um, we can still kind of jump even though if we have cloud cover because the clouds usually is on top of the mountains and then we still have five thousand feet which is i mean especially for a lot of the stuff that Voss has become known for is perfect yeah so when did, I mean, obviously you watched it start to grow and you watched it get more popular and about the time Extreme Week started, but now Voss is a, a name that I don't think any skydiver doesn't know, which for such a small town in Norway is pretty amazing. I mean, especially with the uh, um, the meteoric rise of base jumping and wingsuiting and everything, everybody knows Norway, everybody knows Voss, and pretty much everybody knows Extreme Week. When did you realize, holy shit, this is this is something? Well, the interesting thing is that, um, so so I was uh, the uh, founder, the skydiving founder of the Extreme Week, mm. and the uh, the guy in the rafting company, he was the the other one. So it was kind of the two of us that were discussing. Uh, they were going to have some kind of rafting competition and we were going to have a boogie so we put it on the same week mm. 
also the same week when I was going to have uh, army training, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I remember very well that my kind of idea in the start of the extreme week was exactly this professor. <clears throat> when he listed up these things regarding extreme sport people, then I could recognize some of this in the other kind of extreme sports. So my ambition at that point was for skydivers, one, to land outside on spectacular places and make concerts out in nature. Mm. But more important was to get skydivers to do paragliding and paragliders to do river rafting and river rafters to do skydiving. You know, sure. Intermingle. And when we started it, we had like four founding clubs. That was the paraglider and the river kayak and rafting and skydiving. And then we had two extra, which was base jumping and skating. Mm. but they were not organized in clubs in any way. So they were not part as the other clubs. Sure. And then I was very proud on, on the economy and how we made it. So nobody earns money on this, but all the money gets plowed back into the clubs. Sure. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, then we did the first X-Wing week and next year we suddenly get the sponsor and now we are called Pepsi Max week. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, Eh, this is wrong because now we're starting to run after the money. So we said, mm. thank you, no. We want to go back to the real stuff. And then we, I think we had one year without sponsor and then the sponsor just tripled and, and quadrupled. And yeah, sure. really developed. Well, the community must have absolutely loved it too because, I mean, not only are you going out of your way to try and make sure that you're respectful to the community, but now you're kind of putting them on the map and bringing people to Voss that would never have otherwise gone. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Uh, we did, <laughs> I saw a very uh, quick, actually, that this idea of mingling the people did not work. <laughs> so I remember being at the drop zone. Yeah, it was actually this big, uh, there was like a big football match where Norway beat Brazil or something in soccer. And um, then at the drop zone, I could just see six different groups of people. So over <laughs> there was one group, and those were the rafters. And over there was one group, and those were the kayakers. And over there were the partners. So we didn't mingle. Sure. And also I realized that, well, of course, because let's say the skydivers, suddenly you come to Voss, and now you meet your friends that you didn't see for maybe a year. So of course you want to stay with them. For so sure. that part kind of didn't work. But instead, instead this... Um, festival thing uh, started to build on the side with the concerts and uh, at that point uh, that was when, when we found this circus tent um, and we put that up down by the lake and that became kind of the big uh, central for the extreme week sure and well that's this, a, that's where you'd get all the groups to mingle right is once the party starts yes exactly <laughs> Then, then you'll mingle. Oh, you're a skydiver. Oh, cool. You're a kayaker. Yeah, because <laughs> a little lubrication. Everybody gets a little loose. Nobody's diving directly into their sport. They're just having fun. Yeah. But, and, and you can also probably see that little thing that uh, when you go back to the professor naming these qualities that um, describes the, the uh, extreme sport people, there's still some kind of a ladder. <clears throat> and that was very obvious when we when we got them all together. So <laughs> the bottom, the calm is of course the rafters and the bikers and the and then kind of it goes up as yeah. as the risk goes up. Yeah. The yeah. risk and the consequences and the risk assessment. So the base jumpers, of course, they are the kings. Yeah, yeah. You, you know who's the gonna... base jumpers, they had all the all the um, what's it called? The um oh, the latest uh, technologies like sure. videos and you definitely you definitely know who is going to be the last at the party. Yes. <laughs> Without the, a doubt. The, the cool thing, though, was that when we introduced the, the, the video of the day, which then became the big center point in the whole uh, circus tent, then suddenly we realized that we tough skydivers stand there and we just go, <gasps> mind blown watching the river kayakers doing their stuff. Sure. You know, we got so much respect for the other people's uh, sports that we didn't sure. have before this. And that was kind of what really united us in the Extreme Week and made us really go together and grow as one I, big unit. I can imagine. I mean, um, personally, I'm a huge fan 
of big wave surfing and I can't surf for shit, but I'm an incredible fan of it because I can put myself into that mindset. Even if I've never been there, I can imagine where they're at, so to speak. And I have just an incredible amount of respect for the kind of stuff that they do. The same thing with the kayakers, the same thing with the, the guys that are, although it's a, a cousin sport, the uh, acrobatic paragliders, the, cool. the stuff that they're doing. And I've never done that either, but I can really appreciate the mindset that goes into it, which is the impressive part to me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Nope, I think you froze up there a little bit. On, there we go. Okay. So you've got to, uh, I mean, you, you help start out Extreme Week, you help put Voss on the map, but now we're talking a bunch of years later where, like I said, Voss is, uh, everybody knows it. Everybody knows that Extreme Week is coming up. I know dozens of people that have been there and all the events that uh, that go on there. So are is it just a, we're doing the same thing each year or are you changing things up and always looking for new things to add? Yeah, the that's also kind of a big idea of the extreme week is just to get people on a very high level to come and, and play together sure. and then see what comes out of it. <clears throat> and it has proven to be right every year. Hmm. Every year there comes some kind of a new stunt that has never been done before or some new combination or some new angle or whatever. <laughs> and that's really the beauty. That's, that's how it should be also. Sure. <clears throat> and I would say that again if you if we go back to this very start uh, in the 90s when i was very concerned about the noise for instance in the local village then i was of course very engaged in the local let's call it business life because i was running this hardware store uh, and the whole thing with the extreme week was that it, it changed was completely and it was also to do with timing because the same years we were doing this, they also started to redevelop the uh, mountain, the ski resort, and mm. they built another ski resort on the most snow secure place in Norway. So all of this was happening at the same time. And Voss was, has always been like a tourist village. But what we now did was to change the whole tourism scene uh, into people staying there, mm. spending nights there, spending maybe a week there. And leaving a lot of money. Sure. For the whole uh, the whole business side of us was controlled by the two big hotels, and they were competing. So whenever one of the hotels suggested something, the other one was against. Now through the Extreme Week and the in hops, actually, we we managed to get the richest guy in Norway on board to develop uh, Boss. So in two thousand and six. Then I established this company called Destination Boss, which was mm. kind of the whole message was that let's stop compete, let's stop fighting, let's work together to get money in, and then we can start to compete. Sure. And the whole idea was founded on a, a model of finance that was like the contribution from, let's say, one business would maybe only be thirty bucks or hundred bucks a year, very very low. But then you gathered that money, and then you took that sum of money, and you went to the um, the county. And you said, hey, we have this kind of money. We want to market Voss. Will you come with an equal amount? Mm. So then the amount doubled. And then we together went to the next level. And then we doubled that money again and went to the next level and doubled that money. So suddenly we had eight times our deposit. That we got sure. Back in value. <clears throat> and then the whole idea of destination was, was that everyone was, no one was excluded. Everyone should be, able, be allowed to, to join. And suddenly these two hotels, they lost their their um, controlling power of the development in a way. Mm. And they, even though they were kind of rich in Voss, they were nothing compared to the rich guy. <laughs> 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 and then I'm out talking to all the farmers that are, of course, afraid of this investor coming in from Oslo. And now he's going to take all our money and instead trying to transfer it that, hey, if you're running this farm, you should capitalize on it. Because people coming from uh, city, they would love to come to a farm doing actually farm work or something. Yeah, and you can just be yourself and and uh, and be proud of it. <clears throat> and the money that the investor takes out, yeah, for sure. But off before he takes out that money, we have a lot of money coming in that we divide between us. So don't be scared, kind of. Sure. 
And on that, <clears throat> we had like a big hallelujah meeting <laughs> <laughs> when, we, when we launched it. And we had like 100% um, signing up. It has never happened before in our village. That's awesome. And, and this was what founded the wind tunnel. Which this is, is how the wind, wind tunnel came about. <laughs> which is another crazy thing, right? I mean, you would never yeah. expect that there'd be a wind tunnel in such a, a, a small, out-of-the-way place. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so fantastic. So now... And then just after the wind tunnel, then... Um, then um, I think we're... 2000, I stepped in again as manager of Sky Devos in 2012. And I think maybe 2013, we became the biggest club in Norway, no matter what kind of air sport, no matter what paragliding or, or airplanes or anything that had to do with air. Then little Sky Devos became the biggest in all of Norway. <laughs> that was like incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. And then we came into that position that you just described with uh, now you suddenly possess all these, you know, whatever you need. There's somebody in that club that has these skills or contacts or connections or whatever. <clears throat> and Andreas, the one that uh, took over after me as manager, he has done incredible well doing exactly that. I mean, using yeah. the members to, to uh, yeah, to develop the club. Well, and I mean, the members absolutely love giving back because it gives them um, uh, ownership of the place. You know, I mean, it really puts their heart and soul into it. Besides just being something that they enjoy doing now, they feel like it's theirs as well, which is how it should be. Yeah. So yeah. now besides just Voss, though, you do stuff all over the place. You've got events, I mean, that aren't necessarily nestled in mountains with snow. You're doing it on sandy beaches as well. Yeah, and of course, that was also a long story. <laughs> yeah, I please. Banned. I got permanently banned from skydiving in Norway in 2016. <laughs> All right, you got to fill me in on that. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, it's, it's really a long story, but it, it's kind of interesting too, because um, <clears throat> this starts way back in the extreme week start. As I told you, I was then a captain in the army. Then I was the chief instructor and safety advisor for Skydive Voss and Skydive Bergen and Skydive Ferde. And then I was the uh, chairman of the Extreme Week. And at some point, I think around the year 2000 or something, then the drug squad in the army started to focus on the extreme sport. Mm. And suddenly every year we had the Extreme Week, suddenly you have all these cops coming around. They're trying to hide themselves and be civilians looking for drugs. Sure. <clears throat> and of course, drugs were something something you do see in the skydiving scene. Sure. <clears throat> but it's also a place where it's not really a problem. Sure. And um, in 2003, uh, there was a big... We had a trip to Spain, a club trip. <clears throat> and then coming home from that, I was going straight into my army rehearsal. And then on the army rehearsal, I get like, you know, they, they come with a, a police squad, like they're going to make a demonstration on how to do a, a, a raid during the army trainings. Okay. <clears throat> but it turned out that the whole thing was just a setup to, to get me. <laughs> oh, my Lord. And it turned out that uh, that year I was, um, we had a four-way team going to the nationals. Among other, there were Kari Tro, she's like an Olympic medalist in uh, in freestyle. And another guy that later was uh, um, ch uh, the manager of the wind tunnel. And then there came a fourth guy that we didn't really know. And he was really eager to get into the team. And I was sure that was because he was so in love with Kari. <laughs> <laughs> and later, it, it turns out that he's like a planted agent from the drug squad <laughs> in Norway. And they have sent him to basic camp in the land to be good enough to become on my team they have invested <laughs> you have no idea Holy shit. they've been staking me out for like three years tapping my phone being around my house it's like Holy what the shit. fuck <laughs> <laughs> and then when, when i then came home from the trip in, in spain this informant could then inform that i had 
had a stopover in Amsterdam where I had smoked weed on a coffee shop. Uh. So then when I came home, they knew this. And of course, when I have to pee, it will turn out on my pee. Sure. And there's a zero tolerance in the army, so I had to leave my job. Uh. I mean... Uh. After that, every, every fucking single time I arrive in Norway, I get stripped, searched. One time I had to strip naked and shit in front of grown-up people is so humiliating uh, yeah it would be and still this is now 2023 and it's just a week ago we came back to norway and the same thing every oh. every time for 20 years ay 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 dude <laughs> <laughs> ay that's and pretty I, intense I, yeah and i, I remember when this happened at, at that time, I was like totally destroyed, of course. I had a total breakdown because this happened. And then I had opened a new hardware store and one of the employees had been stealing so much. So at the same time as this army thing is going on, the whole business collapses. Oh. And I have to close down that, that new business I opened. And it almost took the whole family business for 150 years. With wow. <laughs> so all of this is kind of happening on the same time. And that's kind of when I, yeah, broke down. And um, and instead of, I would say, bending over, I, I uh, that's when I started the inhop. Nice. So in two thousand five, we had the first uh, sixteen way um, inhop experience with um, group Daryl Moran coming from uh, UK and Larry Henderson and Kate Cooper. And that was in two thousand five. And then in 2006, I, I developed that onto the uh, Destination Voss, where I had mm. this family thing with uh, the richest guy who made sure. an event for them. That made them come and invest. That ended up with a wind tunnel. So that was all the background for this. Sure. <clears throat> and then, of course, I think the real thing is just a good old power, power game. Because all the skydiving have been controlled by Oslo in mm. Norway. And at one time, I remember there was a death in um, in Stavanger, which is another club, and they just rounded the club mm. until they were done with a with a report. And this was just a total ordinary uh, hook turn death, just a low turn, and he died. Sure. <clears throat> and then a full thing. And then Oslo themselves, that at that time were running the national drops on, they lost a jumper, and they didn't even know. So only in the evening when the cleaning lady comes there and she asks, whose bag is this? Mm. But then it suddenly appears that, hey, we're missing a jumper. And then they take off the Antonov, the drunken pilots, drunken skydivers, <clears throat> and they crash uh, the pl <laughs> plane when they land. And they find the, the girl. She is um, dead, bounced in, a, yeah, in the woods. Sure. But there were no consequences. <clears throat> and that's wow. the first time I really noticed that difference between East and West. And of course, when we then start with the extreme week, we are kind of taking the power. And of course, in whenever we do something, and let's say somebody have a malfunction, then the rumor will very quickly go over the mountain. Sure. But it doesn't go rumors when everything goes well. It's only rumors when everything not goes well. Of course, of course. <laughs> So then uh, after there was some, we had a member who jumped out of a, with a base rig from plane. I was in Portugal at the time, uh, but I was chief instructor and, and responsible, so I grounded him from there. And then by the time I came home, they had grounded the whole club again. <clears throat> Aye. What the fuck? <laughs> and this was kind of the first, this was also around 2000. And then um, I, I noticed that that year when I, in 2003, when all this shit happened in the army and I had to close down the store. That's the first year since I started skydiving that I pulled out of all my engagements. Mm. This year, during the extreme week, um, the, uh, the anti-doping Norway comes with blessings from the Skydiving Federation and they take all the tandem instructors and then me, like for a P-test. Right. <clears throat> and that's also when I found out what the fuck is going on here. This is not the, you know, this is not the, the Federation's task 
sure. to be a drug police or something. Of course, we need to keep drugs is illegal. We need, we need to keep it off the drop zone. We need to keep it out of the skydiving. We can't have any people intoxicated while jumping. Of course. I mean, all this goes without saying. But when you then see that there is actually this much use of different substances in the skydiving community, we, ha we have to deal with it in another way. Sure. And sure. what I observed sure. every year was that there was somebody that got excluded. <clears throat> then you have like a big thing, a big committee or something going against this one poor bastard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then they get kicked out and, and nobody hears from him again. Sure. But then when you look at the skydivers and, and the, the personalities within, <clears throat> then you will notice that on one side you have the, uh, the very successful people, like I talked about the doctors and lawyers and the, all this. They use skydiving as like a supplement to enrich in their otherwise very good life. Sure. On the other side, you have the um, feelings that go, the people that comes with emotions, but they're not really necessarily successful. They use skydiving as a substitute because of some traumas. They can sure. have been raped or have uh, some death or some tragedy or something, bankruptcy, whatever. And then they come into this really intense sport and they get relief. Sure. And when I started to, to look at this closer, I saw that every... <laughs> All these conflicts, all these bannings, they were always on people that you would then put on the emotional side. They're in the skydiving for the feeling of it, not sure. the rational. Sure. And usually it always started with only a conflict between two persons. And then you get all the hype and all the conflicts. And you, you I'm sure you also noticed all the conflicts in all the drops on in the world. Oh, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's always politics, sadly. Yeah, we are very strong individuals, and every time we jump, we kind of uh, confirm ourselves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, so we kind of become even stronger egos. Yeah, and this clashes sometimes. Yeah, definitely part of the sport. Yeah, but what I did not like was that um, a lot of these people that then was kind of kicked out, they were troubled. They had a troubled life and their life improved because of skydiving. And now skydiving kicks them out. Mm. Uh, and then what's happening is that most of these people go to shit. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> they found a relief and our community that actually should do the opposite and take care of these people and help them. They, they yeah. This is I, the worst side, worst side of skydiving. No, I completely agree. I really do. And and it is sad to, when stuff like that happens, although hopefully attitudes are slowly but surely changing. Yeah. Hopefully. But I mean, uh, I mean, on the positive side of things, being able to have gotten Voss to where it was and done all the things that you've done and now spreading even to events outside of Norway and some pretty spectacular places, you're also bringing an incredible amount of positive to the sport. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. So tell me about yeah. the Seychelles event that's coming up. Yeah. So after my, after my banning, I then left Norway and went to Namibia. Uh, after suggesting from a friend and that's where i had my first jump after the banning and i was stoked i remember i i really remember just stretching out in free fall and just feeling oh fuck nobody is allowed to deny this to somebody this is right for <laughs> <If you understand. laughs> i was so triggered and it was a fantastic jump and i had a fantastic toggle hook turn on my landing <laughs> coming right over the, the clubhouse in, in Swakopmund in Namibia and right into the face of the chief instructor. <laughs> oh, fuck. He, and he stands there with this. And I walk over to him, waiting to get yelled at. And then he says, do you want a job? <laughs> nice. <laughs> and then it turned out that he had also had these thoughts about jumping elsewhere. Um, and it just fell together. And we launched the first Namibia event in the end of August in 2016 and three mm. days and it will fill up. Oh, I bet. So that was uh, really the start. Well, I mean, destination boogies are incredibly popular these days. And I mean, the, yeah. the places that have opened up now are insane. Places that I would have never thought you'd be able to jump. Yeah. Yeah. 
is true. How, yeah. how did the how did the Seychelles come about? So that was a consequence of Namibia again. <clears throat> so on the after that first event, my uh, my uh, wife said, "Okay, enough," and divorced me. <laughs> and I had another breakdown in my life. <clears throat> And I left Norway and I left, I gave her the house. So at least they were taken care of. But then I also lost everything I owned mm. because all my mortgages were connected to the security in the house. Sure. So now sure. I lost my family business. My, I had five businesses at the time. So all of this went down the brain. And then I kind of had to restart my life in Namibia. And um, it was actually Patrick Pass that gave me a, a possibility to speak on one of the uh, sequential games we did. Mm. And that came on with Kate Cooper coming on for the next Namibia event. And that's kind of how I, I raised myself again. And then Antonis Loiso, Cypriotic friend, skydiver, he uh, got me into the adventure boogie in Slovenia. So that became suddenly the place I ended up. And then I started the AFF school there. And then we did some Slovenia in hop event. And then back to Namibia. And on one of the Namibia events, then we had uh, Francesco Drossi and Gabor Visco and Pedro Ferreira. And Pedro was a very good friend from Angola. He was the one bringing me to Namibia. And he and Francesco decided to open Drop Zone in Seychelles. Mm. I had to go back to Norway because I had a spider bite I needed to check out. So I stopped in Seychelles for four days on the way back. And that's when Seychelles started. Nice. But then COVID hit. <clears throat> we had signed up, uh, the fully signed up event and we were ready to go and we got the confirmation and everybody transferred their money and then COVID came. And everything was put on hold for another one and a half years. Yeah. And then at the end of the COVID, we, uh, um, we first did the Iceland uh, in-hop event. And then we went back and we did the first Seychelles event. And this was also not working because during the COVID time, we, we lost our plane. So oh. suddenly we are coming up with an event of the COVID with very hard economy and without a plane. And this is when we approached the army in Seychelles and offered, if we can have their plane, we will um, offer to train their first paratroopers. Nice. So that was a, a very nice trade-off that is really beneficial also for them because when you imagine Seychelles is a country of 115 islands and their challenges are pirates, um, uh, thief fish, fishing and smuggling drugs. Sure. <laughs> but it's very, very hard. So for instance, we had uh, pirates stranded on one of the outer islands. Now, was it a year ago? The alarm goes, the Navy goes out, but they, of course, use 20 hours to get there. So by the time they get there, they're gone. Sure. <clears throat> now with the paratroopers, they will be able to reach any of the islands within an hour or so. So after the first testing year with the army, it was all hanging in, let's say, very loose verbal <laughs> agreements. Nothing you can rely on at all. Sure. And then we finished off with uh, doing a demo on the army celebration day, uh, like a year ago. The boys only had like 70 jumps and there were 24 knots of side wind. <laughs> <laughs> and they just did amazing. That's fantastic. <clears throat> then the whole thing got kind of anchored and, and safe. So now sure. we're starting up with the second class, I suppose, in January. And we'll continue the collaboration. And this I is also what gives this amazing opportunity for the for the trip coming up. So as part of the... the um, training for the paratroopers they also now need to jump on all of these different islands they've now spent two years of uh, ground training and just to be able to handle their free fall and canopy piloting and then we have explored some islands in the previous in hops but now finally we are starting to move out to the really exotic and exciting islands the uh, outer islands yeah and, you know, to, to fly, and it's just ocean, and down there you see only one island, and that's all you see in all your visual perimeter. So, like, just now, we, we in October, we did this bird boogie, and Bird Island is the very northernmost of the Seychelles Islands. Mm. And at that point, the wind was blowing from south to the north, so it's blowing you up towards Somalia. 
And because of the spotting, I was hanging on the northern side. So I had headwind against me and I don't know how strong it was. But that feeling to be over the ocean at that very jump, and then I was landing right at the very, very tip, you know, just when the <laughs> sand and the water comes. You know, it's just something you, you cannot, you can't describe it. You can't. No. It, it's just a fantastic feeling when you're hanging under that canopy and you really feel the world. Oh, yeah. Well, and especially in such an epic place. I mean, I yeah. was lucky enough to do a, a season of jumping uh, in Fiji, and it was similar oh, yeah. In that, you know, uh, we did a couple of jumps on outer islands and even on the main island, you're still just scatterings of islands all over the place and a pretty tight window for how you have to fly and to get to the beach. And of course, doing tandems, you never know how big or small the passengers are yeah. going to be. And it's an it's a um, one of the most clear in the moment occasions I've ever had is hanging under canopy over Fiji going, holy shit, this is ridiculous. Oh yeah, I can, I can feel you on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's just spectacular. I mean, you must be super excited, especially because this is coming up pretty soon. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and just yesterday we got the the last sign up, so now the event is confirmed. We needed six minimum to get it going, and we got to number six yesterday. Awesome. We want to get to twenty four. So right now we have eighteen more slots. Awesome. Well, hopefully, uh, hopefully this will help uh, to get it filled out. I mean, I've seen such spectacular photo and video coming out of the Seychelles with the stuff that you guys have done. It's just jaw dropping the it how is. absolutely stunningly beautiful it is. On a side note, Seychelles is where I got married, so I know how pretty. Oh, really? it is. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's stunningly beautiful. And you know this the incredible nature. Yes. And that's, of course, a very big part of all the Inno trips is to connect the local whatever it is. So in Namibia, of course, that's deserts, wild animals, uh, natives, poor people. In Seychelles, it's rich people. Yep. <laughs> but you have a stunning nature and these um, these plants and fishes and birds, at least, they don't exist anywhere else. Yeah, no, it's it's absolutely spectacular. Now, for people that are listening that uh, want to uh, grab one of the slots that's still available, how do they find out about the event? What's the social media that they can go to? Where can they book? So um, <laughs> I would say uh, inhop.com, www.inhop.com with double N and double P. Okay. <laughs> for English speaking people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, you need to clarify. <laughs> Norwegian way of spelling it. And so, and when is the event? It's uh, April 10 to uh, 16. 10th to the 16th. So it's a good event. And this is, you're jumping on all a, a variety of the outer islands, kind of uh, pioneering these different areas. Yeah, it's it's kind of divided into two. The first part is more, um, then we'll jump at more uh, familiar locations. And it's an opportunity for everyone to to check out themselves for their target practice and, and confidence. And then the second half, we're going to all new islands that have never been jumped before. That's spectacular. And I can't look at Poivre I... and Ile de Sud, you'll see the climax on the trip. I can't wait to see the, the pictures in the video that I know are going to come out of this. I mean, again, I've already been blown away with the stuff that I've seen beforehand, but uh, especially jumping unjumped islands and sand that's never touched nylon is going to be pretty spectacular uh, it's fantastic yeah <laughs> i'll tell you evan i cannot thank you enough for taking the time to sit down and and tell me some stories i know there are so many more i'm going to be able to dig out of you so there's going to be a round two down the road for sure we got to talk again and i want to talk after the event as well so i can hear the stories of about opening up those islands and and what's to come next so again thank you so yeah. much thank you take care now all right see you in the sky well there you have it another episode of the lunatic fringe podcast brought to you as always by well wait not as always actually brought to you now by gyro formerly known as nz aerosports you'll head to gyro.com for their next level line of canopies by Pussfoot, the Extreme Sports Collective. Head over to Pussfoot.com to check it out. 
by Summit Parachute Systems. Check out SummitParachuteSystems.com to talk to Jarrett Martin and the gang about kick-ass pilot rigs, rigging courses, and more. By Flyaway Indoor Skydiving. Go to FlyawayTN.com and check out all the cutting-edge stuff to come. By Pure Spectrum CBD. Head to PureSpectrumCBD.com to check out their wide range of CBD products. And as for us, head to the LunaticFringePodcast.com to listen to any of the hundreds of episodes currently available. Hit the link for our YouTube channel, pick up your copy of the Lunatic Fringe book or The Accidental Stripper, and get a sneak peek at upcoming guests. Once again, thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Damn. <laughs>